reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. Uh, Dr. Hayek, uh, clearly in your work you see a strong relationship between property and its security and freedom. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could uh, describe that relationship as you see it for us. Well, to be able to pursue one's own aims, it's essential to know what means are available to one. I think that's only possible by some recognized procedure which decides about the sphere of command over resources which each person has. You must both have the, at any one moment, know which means he can use for his own purposes and he can aim at changing that protected sphere, acquiring new means which then are at his future disposal. In fact, the general aim at acquiring means one can later use for one's own purposes seems to be essential to freedom and can only be satisfied by some rules of property in the material means of production. It's essential, property is essential to freedom, I suppose. Uh, are you saying because it gives you an independence of government which you would not otherwise have? And you've well, talked about it in terms of being Independence able of government and my fellows. Mm -hmm. It's really a sphere in which I cannot be cursed. And if freedom is uh, freedom from coercion, coercion, it depends on really on my being able to assemble a set of means for my purposes that is the essential condition of the rational pursuit of an aim I have I set myself. If I am at each stage dependent on as it were, the permission or consent of any other person, I could never systematically pursue my own ends. I think this must go back to our prior discussion of the fact that we are becoming a freer society in some senses, yes. uh, sense of permissiveness of what may be said, what may be done, about uh, sexual permissiveness and so forth. But what you're saying is that at the same time we're becoming more heavily regulated in our property rights, which are crucial. And these other freedoms will prove illusory if we lose our control of uh, property well, rights. What do you mean by regulated? I would confine the regulation to the approval or disapproval of particular ends pursued. If it's merely a question of delimiting the sphere of means I can use for my own purposes, as so long as I can determine for what end I use them, I'm free. Mm -hmm. No, I was thinking of the overall uh, condition of freedom in the oh. society. And I suppose what, what the point would be, would be that the government is now so heavily confiscating, regulating uh, mm. property, that if those freedoms ultimately mm. disappear, these other freedoms that we think we have will disappear in consequence, once the government has control of the economic base. Uh, yes. Uh, no, that's a field in which I have great difficulty, particularly when it comes to the problem of expropriation for any purpose. That, of course, is the most severe infringement of the principle of private property, and one where I have to admit there are circumstances in which it is inevitable. It's the most difficult point to draw my line. I think the only precaution I would wish is uh, by way of the rules of compensation, I would even be inclined to demand some multiple compensation in the case of expropriation to put a required limit on expropriation. 
But apart from this very troubling issue of expropriation, I think all limitations, particularly, certainly all discriminatory, uh, is, uh, infringements of property rights are object to. Uh, I think I ought to bring in here another point. Most of the real need of uh, such measures is probably on the local and not on the national sphere. And I'm inclined, in a way, to give the local authorities powers which I would deny to the central government, because people can vote with their feet against what the local governments mm -hmm. can do. And do. Uh, this concept of the protection of property, of course, is now in tension or in opposition to uh, demands made in the name of social justice. Uh. And uh, you think that social justice is not only used as a concept for the wrong purposes, but you f in fact think it is no concept, I gather. It's completely empty. I'm convinced it's completely empty. The justice is an attribute of human action, not of a state of affairs. And uh, the application of uh, uh, the term social justice assumes a judgment of the justice of a state of affairs irrespective of how it has been brought about. And that deprives it of its meaning. Nothing to do with justice is an attribute of human action. But you yourself have a preference for a certain kind of a society which has a maximum amount of freedom in it. Yes. And I suppose you wouldn't call that a socially just society. No. Uh, but how, what, what general term would you use to describe it? Well, I have to think I would just stick to a free society, or a society of free men, I would rather say. Free persons. Well, but doesn't, doesn't the uh, demand for social justice merely mean, as a shorthand, for a preference for a different kind of society? Well, it's used like that, no doubt. But why then speak about justice? Oh, it's to appeal to people uh, to support things which they otherwise would not support. I see. Your objection really is, 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 is it's a, f a form of fraudulent rhetoric. Yes. Because it implies a standard of justice against which a society yeah, exactly. can be measured. Exactly. And actually what they're talking about is a set of preferences, mm. not a standard mm. for measurement. Well, it's really a pretense that there is some common principle which people share with each other but if they were deprived of the use of this term, they would have to admit my personal preference. It's an unfair form of rhetoric. <laughs> I see. All right. Uh, now, uh, you, you make the strong statement in your book that the, ne the necessity for rules arises out of ignorance. Uh, and I think, but you also concede, I gather, that there are other reasons for rules. That for example, you say, uh, you say at one point that in a uh, society of omniscient persons, uh, there would be no, if everybody knew all of the facts and all of the effects of actions, there would be no room for a conception of justice because everyone would know the effects of an action and the relative importance of those effects. Uh, but suppose the uh, interests of omniscient Persons differ, so they adopt different modes of conduct, uh, uh, producing different effects. Uh, is it impossible to have a concept of justice merely because they're omniscient? I mean, doesn't justice have something to do with, uh, and therefore rules, have something to do not only with ignorance or omniscience, but with evil or minority interests? Uh, perhaps my statement is too strong. Omniscience itself would not be sufficient, but uh, omniscience would at least make a possibility of, uh, creates a possibility of agreeing on the things, which without the omniscience you can't. Yeah. I mean, you may be unable to agree even with omniscience, <laughs> but <laughs> without it, it's clearly totally impossible. Yeah, you could have evil omniscient persons, uh. so that rules depend or are. Uh, arise not merely because of ignorance, but because of uh, disagreement about morals. Yes, oh, surely. And uh, disagreement about interests. Mm. Uh, now, in this uh, 
area of societies which evolve spontaneously, uh, for which you show a strong preference. Uh, I mentioned earlier that there are societies that evolved in an unfree way, but uh, you said, well, when they're unfree, they don't evolve. Uh, and therefore, we can't say that uh, evolution leads to unfreedom. Mm -hmm. And it's been suggested that feudal structures really evolved uh, spontaneously. I don't think. You don't think so? Everywhere been military conquest. Uh, always? W or was, was there a, uh, was there an, were there occasions? I haven't come across it. I haven't really examined history on this, but in the European history, with which I'm most familiar, it's fairly clear that it were military bands who conquered the country. I mean, uh, it seems that the German tribes who expanded from Germany, south and west, uh, conquering the country, established a feudal regime. I mean, the conqueror acquiring the land and having uh, people working as serfs on it seems to have been the origin of... Uh, or, or perhaps, it, it, you, I suppose you would suggest that sometimes it may have grown up in defense against... Uh, the need for protection against outsiders, uh, but quite, that would be quite, yes, sir. Of course, it need not have been a foreign conqueror. It very frequently was the need of establishing a military class in defense who then uh, became dominant in a feudal way. But it, it was really the need for... Uh, it was really military organization rather than economic organization but for feudalism. I was wondering, because I, it seemed to me at times in your book that you were identifying the evolutionary society as the good society and the evolutionary law as the good law, and yet you also had another value, which was freedom. And I guess what you're really saying, or as I understand it now, mm -hmm. is that, in fact, those two become one. Yes, If it evolves, it will be a free society. Uh, evolution creates a possibility of choice un only uh, under freedom. If you do not have freedom, but the thing is directed by a superior authority, you have no longer a selective evolution where the better success, the more effective succeeds, but what succeeds is those who, it is determined by those who are in power. Oh, I see. It's the process of evolution that, that, that is indistinguishable from freedom. But that, that is not to deny that the process of evolution may lead to an unfree state. It may well, uh, it may well do, yes. Well, that's why freedom needs safeguards. That's why the need for legislation. Freedom, fr yes. Legislation ought to be a safeguard of freedom, but it can be used to suppress freedom. That's why we need principles of legislation. We, we certainly do, but I, uh, I think I've exp <laughs> expressed my uh, Thoughts about that? Well, that really means then, if we're talking about an evolutionary society, one without strong central direction, mm -hmm. one in which uh, property is safeguarded, that really means that your conception of justice is really closely bound up with a capitalist order, or at least a free market order. A free market order, order based on private property, yes. And uh, you knew this is a very old theory. I think John Locke already argued that. In fact, he asserts at one stage that the proposition, which can be demonstrated like any proposition of Euclid, that without property there can be no justice. Well, I'm having a little trouble with that word justice. Is, uh, is justice, anything, in your thought, anything other than uh, those rules which are required to maintain freedom? Does it have any other content than that? Uh, no, Ru yes. Uh, I don't think they have rules of conduct. I would em emphasize not rules about determining a state of affairs, which you can even describe a desirable state of affairs in the form of rules, which would not be rules of conduct, or rules of conduct only for a dictator, not for the individuals. Rules of individual conduct, uh, which uh, lead to a peaceful society require private property as part of the rules. That's the way I would put it. 
Yeah, but, but, but I, you, you discuss what you call the vexing question of the relationship between justice and law. Yeah. And I'm not quite sure what justice is in this context, except those attributes of law which lead to a free society. Is that it? Or is there, are, there, are there more requirements of justice? I think it's a uniform for all people. No. Well, but is that derived from the need for freedom? The uniformity for all people? Or is that derived from an independent moral base? I, I think it derives from the need for freedom. If they're not uniform, it means that some people can discriminate. It means that there are some people are really subject to the people who can discriminate. And being independent of the coercion of other people excludes any such discrimination by an authority. So that the whole concept of justice describes those attributes of law which we have identified as being necessary to the maintenance of a free society. Yes. And no yes. and not and no other yes. no other source. Um, Now, you, you also talk about the, in your second volume particularly, about what it is uh, that, a, that a judge or a legislator must do to develop a system of law. And you describe, for example, the judge or the legislator when he faces a situation not faced before, not recognized before, and his need to... Uh, understand all of the rules the society already has mm -hmm. in order to frame a new rule which is consistent mm -hmm. and compatible with those and not contradictory. Uh, doesn't that really plunge you into a requirement of something approaching omniscience that, that gets you into the trouble that the uh, constructivist rationalists have? Uh, not really omniscience. I think it's a uh too big a task for any brain. You can only try and gradually achieve it. But uh, the condition is merely a double consistency. It's on one hand compatibility of any one rule with the rest of the rules, but not only logical compatibility, also aiming at the same ultimate results. I mean, the rules can conflict, not logically, but by produce it by aiming at different results which are in conflict with each other. So you have to aim at consistency of system in this double sense. Non-contradiction between the rules themselves and non-contradiction between the ends at which they aim. Well, that, that raises two kinds of problems for me. One is the, uh, you say that no single mind could really do mm -hmm. that. Uh, and when I, when I think of not a single mind, but say a Supreme Court of nine people trying to do that, uh, I, I begin to despair of the possibility of developing law with that, with that uh, uh, precision and intellectuality. But in addition to that... Uh, well, the law makes mistakes in its development which can later be corrected. Well, yes, or, or compounded. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. But uh, why is uh, consistency in rules required? Why may not society take inconsistent moral positions on issues? And, uh, because it necessarily leaves the decisions uncertain. Wherever there's a conflict, that means there are two possible conclusions to be drawn, two different conclusions. Well, that's true. You can either obey the one or the other, <laughs> and whichever you choose, uh, get a different result. And I think the oh, aim is... I see, but, but no, I, I, I see what you mean. You mean it's all right to have a rule that applies there uh -huh. and a rule that applies over here to different subject matters, and they may be philosophically and morally inconsistent, and that's all right, yeah. as long as they don't conflict in the individual case where a decision has to be made. But they're bound to sooner conflict in an individual case. Well, of course, you know, uh, it has been said, and I was, I was raised to believe, probably by legal positivists whom I didn't recognize, uh, in their guise, uh, actually by legal realists, uh, uh. Uh, that law really is like a system of parables. 
And for every parable that looks in one direction, there is its exact opposite. Uh, and that's what gives judges freedom. Uh, you know, the, uh, a switch in time saves nine, uh -huh. but haste makes waste. Uh -huh. And that law is inevitably like that because human life is like that. With, uh, so that clear general rules become, in a sense, impossible. And what is required, what, what results, is a set of opposing conceptions between which the judge chooses in individual cases. On the basis of what? On the, well, that we don't know. Uh, well, we do know, unfortunately. Yeah. He, may, he may choose because many judges have become constructivist rationalists and oh. have decided to improve the society, oh. which is quite bad. He may choose because he doesn't quite understand, which is, which is mm -hmm. quite common. Or he may choose because he thinks the temper of the times, the general area uh -huh. of moral expectations in which he lives, uh -huh. says that in this case he chooses a switch in time saves nine rather than haste uh -huh. makes waste. But it's, a, it's, an, it's an almost a, uh, at the margin where these uh -huh. two compete. It's almost an intuitional judgment. Yes, what it amounts to is that uh, judge is not really guided by the inherent st structure of the law, but by certain extra-legal ideological concepts. And that's just what I would like to exclude. <laughs> well, I, 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 I'm afraid that's what's inevitable. That's what's, that's what's troubling me about... about Is it really inevitable? You see, it's so much more marked in the United States than it's elsewhere that I wonder whether this is really <coughs> inevitable or not a result of a peculiar tradition. Well, let me... Let me um let me suggest that it may be so marked here than elsewhere precisely because we have a written constitution which gives judges enormous power that they do yes. not possess elsewhere. And that but this is a necessary effect of a written constitution or is the effect of a particular form of constitution? I would think it's a necessary effect of, of saying to judges, here is holy writ. You are the sole interpreters of it. And that begins to develop attitudes of mind, uh, which gives great freedom, because that holy writ is necessarily written in very general terms. Yes. You know that it may lead away from what you are saying, but it reminds me of the fact that I, my whole theory leads me to deny the Constitution the character of law. Constitution is an instrument of organization. It's not an instrument of rules. And perhaps the American Constitution tries too much to be law and is, uh, ought to be understood merely as an instrument of uh, principles of organization rather than principles of conduct. In effect, they should have stopped with the first three articles, defining the Congress, the uh, presidency, and the courts, and, effect, and, and stopped the, and yes. not continued. I, uh, you know, I probably mentioned in my book the funny story of German legal philosophy in the last century when they had elaborated what I think is a very fine definition of what law, as they called it, law in the material sense meant. And suddenly somebody pointed out, but you exclude the constitutional law from law. And it so shocked them that they abandoned the whole thing. <laughs> Well, yeah, you, you, the, the, it would be possible to have a constitution which is merely organizational yeah. Yeah. and which, uh, as you uh, say... Which, in limiting the powers of government and legislation to coercion only according to formal rules, would be limit power, but would not lay down any rules of law. We just say that people had no power than that. Dr. Hayek, I think you just laid down a rule of law with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends whether you call this a rule of law. Well. It's a rule of organization, determining what powers particular people have. You refer to Edmund Burke uh, right. approvingly, and uh, I too uh, like Edmund Burke and his approach to uh, matters. But Burke is essentially uh, uh, a man with moral principles, but uh, a, a very pragmatic man about moral sure, principles, sure. and uh, one who uh, does not try to lay down general rules for the society. And I wonder if there is, perhaps in your own position, a tension, almost 
arising something uh, towards an inconsistency in that approving of an evolutionary formation of law, uh, approving of Burke, uh, you nonetheless begin to construct really pretty hard rules about what law mm -hmm. must be about. Well, it's, uh, I'm distinguished between the rules and principles in this respect. I'm afraid you use it, I believe, in American uh, jurisprudence perhaps slightly differently from what I mean. But uh, I'm uh, suggesting tests which the law must satisfy, not the contents of the law. And I think that is uh, true of all we can do about any kind of uh, system of thought. In fact, I am rather pleased to see that there is an extraordinary similarity between my test of uh, legal rules and Popper's test of empirical rules. A certain similarity, they neither say anything about their material content, but they define certain characteristics. Any rule which fits into the system of a free society must satisfy. But of course the temptation, particularly if you so I do in my volume three, venture into providing a constitutional setup then it works. Of course, uh, it does go beyond it, but it's, uh, even that is m more meant to exemplify what kind of system would satisfy my criteria. And the particular example is much less important than the principle. It's an illustration of how the principles could be put into effect. I see. But uh, I suppose a, a Burkean might say that the attributes of law or the principles ought to be allowed to evolve as well. Well, they will. I'm not laying down the law. I'm putting something, offering something to choose from. I see. Law is, uh, evolution is always a selection between alternatives. The, uh, I suppose as a lawyer who uh, is somewhat uh, dubious about the power of law to, to control uh, large events and movements, I uh, would offer this suggestion. Perhaps your position places really too much emphasis on law in the sense that you think law with proper attributes can control the direction of the society or at least prevent the society from moving in the wrong direction. Whereas I would suggest that much of our history suggests that law is really powerless to withstand strong social, philosophical, political movements and will reflect those movements rather than stopping them. Yes, I'm afraid that is true. But I try to operate on the political movements. You know, my general attitude to all this has always been that I am not concerned with what is now politically possible, but I try to operate on opinion to make things politically possible which are not now. Well, I, I, I quite agree with that. I quite agree with that, but I was... It, it leads me to the thought that perhaps the importance of your work is more in its demonstration that certain opinions and certain movements are bad than perhaps in its ability to state the necessary attributes of good law. Because the real moving force will be in the opinions about society rather than in the opinions about what characteristics law must have to be just. Well, uh, my definition of what characteristics law, uh, law must have to be just is, of course, also an attempt to work on opinion to make this sort of thing more acceptable. But my main concern, of course, is to create an apparatus which prevents the abuse of governmental powers. Uh, perhaps uh, I come away uh, from your work, which I found enormously stimulating, less convinced that uh, the apparatus uh, can save us than that 
your explanation of the way a society operates mm -hmm. uh, leads me to believe that legislators and judges ought to be persuaded to greater modesty about their powers, uh, about their intellectual understanding, mm -hmm. and that, that would be a sufficient lesson for them to carry away. Yes, but there's another point, you know, I'm frankly trying to destroy the superstitious belief into our particular conception of democracy, which we have now, which certainly is ultimately ideologically determined, but which has created, without our knowing it, an omnipotent government, which has really completely unlimited powers, and to recover the old tradition, which was only defeated by the modern superstitious democracy, that government needs limitations. And uh, for 200 years, the building of constitution aimed at limiting government. Now suddenly we have arrived at the idea where government, because it's supposedly democratic, needs no other limitations. And what I want to make clear is that we must reimpose limitations on governmental power. Uh, that's entirely true. Whether that can be done through law and constitutions is a, re a remaining question. Uh, what we see in America, I think, is government becoming much more powerful, but part of government being the courts, supposedly, the courts applying rules which are supposed to limit government, but in fact enhance the power of courts. When nobody could believe more strongly the law is only effective if it's supported by a state of public opinion. Mm -hmm. That brings me back. I'm operating on public opinion. I'm not aiming direct. I don't even believe that before public opinion has changed, a change in the law will do any good. I think the primary thing is to change opinion on these matters. When I say public opinion is not quite correct, it's really, again, the opinion of the intellectuals or the mm -hmm. upper strata which govern public opinion. But the primary thing is to reinstall a certain awareness of the need of governmental powers, which after all has existed for a very long time, which we have lost. Well, in that I couldn't agree with you more, mm -hmm. and I think that may be an appropriate place for me to stop. Thank you very much. Well, it was very enjoyable. <laughs> I enjoyed it very much.